I think I could listen to the dean speak all day. <laughs> well, congratulations to all of you, and to all of you who shepherd your loved ones, our graduates here. I sat in your seat 35 years ago, and my number one emotion was relief. Thank goodness. And for those, I know my parents and my siblings took up most of one section. They felt they were stunned. So I congratulate all of you, and this is really an important day. I remember my graduation, but I do not remember my commencement speaker. I don't remember the message. All I remembered, it was too long. So I will attempt to make this not so memorable. I want to share three quick things with all of you that I wish someone had shared with me when I was in your seat. I wish somebody would talk to me about the changing world in which I was going to go enter. I wish somebody would have talked to me a bit about the journey of learning, and then I wish they would have given me a couple of hints or updates or suggestions on how to develop and build a career. As Dean Sanger mentioned, I grew up on a farm, one of 11 children, and I remember milking cows with my dad, being the oldest boy, talking about his life. He'll be 93 this year, and he's still in great health, but he talked to me about the first time an airplane flew over my hometown. Everybody came out, the church bells were ringing. Half the farmers thought it was a John Deere. The other didn't quite know it was green. He talked about the first time they got a radio in their home. It was attached to a big battery. The battery was not rechargeable. Incidentally, rechargeable batteries is kind of a new phenomenon. And they only listened to it on Saturday nights for one hour as a family to something called Fibber, McGee, and Molly. Still, he thinks that's the best program ever. He talked about the first car he had seen. So I was lamenting, saying to him, I wish I would have grown up in your generation, Dad, because everything that's worth anything is already invented. There'd be nothing left in my, in my uh, generation to be invented how wrong I could have been and was. In 1980, when my classmates and I prepared for where you are today, we did the following things. We called our parents to make sure they'd be on time, and we called them collect. You probably know what that means. We made sure we filled the ice tray in the freezer part of our refrigerator with water, so if we wanted to drink a little beverage tonight, we would have ice. When we drove here, we rolled up our windows and we locked the car door with the second key, not the ignition key, it didn't fit, you had to actually a lock key. We made sure we had enough film in our camera. We bought either Fuji or Kodak film and we wanted to make sure we knew where we could get it uh, processed later that day. So lots of things. And, and other thing we would have done is call the theater to make sure we knew what time the movies were, in case we want to take somebody to a movie. So much has changed. In fact, change is our life. Some of you, or one of you, will be here 35 years from today. You will be addressing the class of 2050. And you might say the following. Remember when we had passwords? Remember when we used to plug in our cell phone? Remember when we wrote checks? Remember when we had a credit card? I don't know why you would need a card. Remember when we used to put gas in our car? I know you think I'm old. I am old. There are people who actually live to be this old and graduated in 1980. None of you were around at that time. I get that. But the things that you say today that you think is normal language would have been so foreign, it would have been a foreign language when I sat in your seat. 
There was no Google. There was no Apple Pay. There was no online, offline, social media, ISP address, Venmo, Facebook. In fact, you guys even use common words differently. In my generation, when something was blowing up, that was a bad thing. Now you guys think that's a good thing. It's blowing up. If somebody would say, you're sick, you'd go to the doctor. Now when you think something's good, that's sick. And what's this thing about dog? Somebody call you a dog, that'd be terrible. Now you say, what up, Dean Dog? And that's like, you know, how you doing, Dean? In fact, if you look back just to 1980, the top market cap company in the country, in the world, in fact, we all know it's Apple, worth over 740 or 50 billion market cap. It was a garage find in 1980, not yet a public company. In the state of Minnesota, the most valuable company in 1980, when I graduated, sat in your seat, was 3M Corporation. Today, it's a company that wasn't even around in 1980, United Healthcare. So things do change. I was in Silicon Valley last week with one of the most respected computer engineers, and he said to me, what we've seen so far in technology is the first five minutes in a year-long endeavor to change the world. I want to leave you with one quote on change. It comes from Benjamin Franklin 250 years ago. And it's as true today as it was then. He said, when you're finished changing, you're finished. Embrace change, be a change agent. Let me move on to my second point. When I graduated, I was so full of knowledge, I couldn't wait for the world to discover me. Come to me, I've got all the answers. Oh, I know none of you feel that way, but I felt that way. There's a very wise British humorist who said the following, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing it does not belong in a fruit salad. Your goal is wisdom. I know a lot of really smart people who have lots of knowledge who say perfectly stupid things all the time. You'll find that common sense is not so common. And the best way people go on the journey from knowledge to wisdom is by making mistakes, or they call it experience. And I wish I would have been much more aggressive in sharing my mistakes and learning from other people's mistakes along the way. You're not going to live old enough to make all the mistakes yourself. Learn from others' mistakes. And also, never fall out of love with learning. I was in a taxi cab in New York City about a year and a half ago. I tend to learn some of the most valuable lessons from taxi cab drivers. This driver, I could tell by his accent, was not from Minnesota. And we started talking, and I learned he spoke five or six languages. And he told me something that stuck with me since that day. He said, if you speak three languages, you are trilingual. If you speak two languages, you are bilingual. If you speak one language, you are an American. <laughs> so what did I do? At age 60, ich studiere Deutsch schon seit sieben Monaten. Es ist sehr schwer für mich, aber ich werde versuchen. I started learning to speak German. And did you know there's a nominative case in speech, an accusative case, and a dative case? I never knew that. Well, I think they taught it, but that was junior high school, boys and girls. I didn't get that at the time. The point is, the people who are the happiest on this planet fall in love with learning. 
and they never stop. There's an old saying that you've heard, and I want to add something to it. Give someone a fish for a day. Give someone a fish you'll eat for a day. Teach someone how to fish you'll eat for a lifetime. Teach someone how to learn, and they'll eat more than just fish. We want you to have a full and complete diet, including broccoli. Let me go to my third point, and that's about building a career. I talk with a lot of young people, and I ask them, what are your career aspirations? They say, I want to be you. I said, no, you don't want to. You want to be you. And I have found that careers are uniquely three-legged stools. They're one-third company. Work for a company that shares your culture, your values, your beliefs, your ethics. If you are a us person, work for an us company. Secondly, work for a boss who gives you the real stuff, who really wants to invest in making you a better team member, more productive and happier, and make sure that you have balance in your life. I remember it was in late 1982, it happened to me. Every time I was asked to make a presentation to a small group of team members, a large group, whatever, I was conveniently busy that day. My aunt would die for the second time. Cows needed to be milked. I had to go back north. And finally, my boss came in one day and said, I got you. You don't like to speak in front of people. And I went as red or as maroon as the color right up here. And he said to me, he said, there's nothing wrong with that. Up there with snakes and heights and death, public speaking is one of the top five things to be scared about. He said, either fix it or find a job that doesn't require it. So I joined Toastmasters the next week. I was living in Arden Hills at the time. I had to get an early bus to get someplace so I could connect to Minneapolis, where I was working at the time. And I go and meet 80 strangers I'd never met before. It's kind of like a volunteer dentist appointment. Yeah. <laughs> so I get there, 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm already an hour and a half into my day. And they welcome me as a new member. There's 80 people I've never met before. And the first order of business after calling me in the order was they said, it's extemporaneous speaking time, which means scare the living heck out of the new guy time. So they said, John Stumpf, new member, please stand up and tell us how you're going to help your wife prepare the turkey for Thanksgiving this year. This was sometime early November. Well, it was absolutely three minutes or three and a half minutes of just living hell. I was stammering and stammering and awing and umming. And every time I would say ah or um, a little bell went off. So at the end of three and a half minutes, I slump in my chair. I am worn out. I've had two root canals, and I've had an extraction. And I'm just sitting there, and the head of the club says to the timekeeper, how many ums and ahs did Mr. Stump say? They said, it's a new club record, 62 in three minutes. We've never seen that before. I don't know if you've been listening or not, but I don't think I used an um or an ah in my talk today. I'm not reading a speech. I could never have done that 35 years ago or 30 years ago, but for the kindness and care of a person I worked for who really cared about me. And the final thing is investing in yourself. Berkshire Hathaway, through Warren Buffett, is Wells Fargo's largest owner. Warren is the most successful investor the world has ever known. He owns almost 10% of our company. His investment's worth over $28 billion just in our stock alone. And he has a very, he has a number of very famous and interesting, important sayings. One of them is, invest in yourself. It'll be the best investment you ever make. And I couldn't agree with him more. I
want to make a couple of comments at the end about the University of Minnesota. You guys are already off to a fabulous start. You join a very elite group of people, and you join a family that I'm part of. We are now all, or you're soon to be, alumni of the University of Minnesota. We're golden gophers. And I am pro-education at every level and every type of school. And living in California, my daughter lives two blocks from Berkeley, Cal. I spend a lot of time down at Stanford. I'm all over the state. We have bankers and banks across the United States involved with many schools. But there is something special about this place. Not only do you learn the discipline of management or finance or accounting, whatever your academic area is, but you also learn values here. You learn ethics. You learn the concept of working together. And you learn a certain sense of humility which will carry you a long way. In fact, if you look at some of the graduates of this school, and they populate business at all levels, including the C-suite across the globe. The largest market cap company headquartered in San Francisco is Wells Fargo. The University of Minnesota alum leads that. And you'd say, well, yeah, John, but you're the exception. Exceptionally average. Any one of you, if you choose to, could be on the same kind of career path. Just to show this is not one and done, the largest company in San Francisco, and I happen to know that market the best, I've been there 13 years now, the largest revenue company is McKesson. Its CEO is John Hammergren from Alexandria, Minnesota, and yes, a University of Minnesota graduate. One of the most famous studios in California and LA and the most famous of destination resorts is Disney. Their new chief operating officer is Tom Skaggs, a Minnesotan who is a graduate of the University of Minnesota. So there's very, something very special about this place. We work hard. We care for each other. We don't take ourselves too seriously. And there is this sense of humbleness or sense of humility. One of my favorite authors is Garrison Keillor. He has a famous saying, he said, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth, but so far all we've gotten is Minnesota and North Dakota. <laughs> but I like the one that I have better. And that's the one that goes this way. Minnesota Golden Gophers, as it relates to humility, don't think less of themselves they just think of themselves less. Let me repeat that. Golden Gophers don't think, about, don't think less about themselves. They just think about themselves less. That's what makes this part of the world and what you do and what you've accomplished so special. Let me end by saying thank you for being here today. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. This is my first commencement speech ever. So it's a thrill to have it here where I consider home with a university that I hold so dear and I couldn't be who I am today without the kindness and support of this whole village known as the University of Minnesota. Thank you.